What proof is there that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead? John's guests for this debate are U.S. diplomat Mr. John K. Nalen, who is a Foreign Service officer currently assigned to the United States Embassy in San Jose, Costa Rica. Mr. Nayland is skeptical about Jesus' resurrection and has argued against the historical accounts in his article in The Free Inquiry, America's primary secular humanist magazine. Presenting the evidence for the resurrection will be Dr. John Warwick Montgomery, a practicing trial lawyer both in Great Britain and in America. He holds two PhDs, first from the University of Chicago and a second doctorate from the University of Strasbourg, France plus seven additional graduate degrees in law, theology, library sciences, and other fields. He has written over 125 scholarly journal articles and authored 40 different books. We invite you to stay tuned to find out for yourself if there is solid historical evidence that will convince a skeptic that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Welcome to our program. Tonight we're going to be examining the questions, are the New Testament documents reliable? Who wrote them and when? Do the Gospel writers contradict each other in describing the different places that Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection? Now for the skeptic to disprove Christianity, he must supply proof that first, the Gospels were not written by the men who claimed to have written them. This in spite of the fact that the Christian church in its first 300 years overwhelmingly attested that these men did write them. Second, the skeptic must prove that the authors did contradict each other in their writings. It will not be enough for the skeptic to say, it seems the writers contradicted each other, when a plausible idea can easily harmonize the accounts. Let me illustrate. Picture your family going to grandma's house for an entire day to meet with all of the relatives in order to celebrate someone's birthday. A few days after this big event, your mother, grandmother, and sister all write letters to your brother at college who wasn't able to come home for the party. Now suppose that someone at the college read all three letters and told your brother that in his opinion, the three writers of the letters shouldn't be believed since they all contradicted each other. Although the three writers claimed to be at the same party, they each wrote about different people and different events that took place. And such contradictions prove that the three letter writers weren't at the same party. In fact, there never was a party at all. Well, after reading the letters, your brother would laugh at such a ridiculous conclusion. Why? Because it would be perfectly reasonable that his mother would describe the health of Aunt Sally and Uncle Bill and tell whether Uncle Charlie had gotten a job. He also wouldn't be surprised that Grandma had described the different kinds of food that she had served and who gave presents to the children. And finally, he would expect his sister to write in detail about which of the cousins brought a date to the party and what they looked like. The brother at college would easily understand in reading the letters that three different points of view were being expressed and easily harmonize all of the events. He would not expect them to describe every single person at the party, or for each of them to write about the same things the others did. Rather, he would expect them to place the emphasis on what they thought was important. And because they did so, he would not think they contradicted each other. Now apply this illustration to the writers of the four Gospels. The skeptics say, that if only one of the gospel writers describes the guards at the tomb, namely Matthew, and another is the only author who tells about a special message that the angels gave to Peter, namely Mark, and a third writer is the only one who gives a full account of the men who buried Jesus, namely John, then these three writers have irreconcilably contradicted themselves. Well, such thinking is ridiculous. Each of the writers was free to record what he thought was important of the events surrounding Jesus' resurrection. And because each writer includes bits and pieces of information which the others do not, there is nothing wrong with that. It is an indication of truthful, independent reporting. 
We must also keep in mind that when one of the four authors emphasizes some specific person or group, he seldom says that is the only person who was there and no one else was present. These writers usually do not say that Jesus appeared at one place and no other, yet the critic constantly puts words into the disciples' mouths like, this was the only person mentioned, or this was the first appearance Jesus made to the disciples. But if the disciples do not say only this person was present, or this was the first appearance of Jesus, then they should not be forced by the critic to say so. With this as background, let's get to our debate, and here's the very first question that I asked. Let me start you off with okay. one. How about Thomas, okay? Honest skeptic. And listen, when I say that, I appreciate your being here tonight, and I know there's a lot of folks that are listening tonight that are exactly in the same case. I mean, we're kidding ourselves if we think at the universities in this country that nobody believes that. Uh, there are many professors that do believe in the faith, but as a whole, there are more people that are probably uh, uh, in your situation and uh, listening attentively tonight. So I appreciate your being here, and I want you to speak from your heart and feel free. You're among friends here tonight. We can disagree, but we are going to be friends. Now, I, I want to come down to this thing that we do say that we have historical evidence, and we have the testimony of a, of a disciple who did not believe when everybody came and said, hey, we've seen Jesus, okay? He said, I won't believe until you give me the empirical evidence. I want to see the body. I want to check out the hands where the, the nails went in. I want to see the side where, the, where the, the spear went into, and I won't believe until then. And you have the fact in the book of John, I think it's John 20, that uh, Jesus, in another one of the gatherings with the disciples, appears to them, and the first thing he says is, hey, Thomas, over here. And he said, uh, you know, I, I always wondered what Thomas was thinking right at that point. No, that's okay, Jesus, uh, I'm, I'm convinced. And then he says, come on over here, check it out, check it out. Now, at the end of his checking it out, putting his hands on Jesus' hands where the wounds were at, etc. You have his exclamation, his statement in the record. My Lord, my God. That's his conclusion. What do you do with Thomas's testimony? Okay, this is an excellent place to start because it, it, it leads to one of the points which I'd like to make tonight. Yes. You're talking about John chapter 20, the appearance to the doubting uh, Thomas. Now that's in John, the second appearance of the risen Jesus to the apostles. And the previous one was his appearance to the ten. So John 20 talks about the first appearance being to the ten. Okay. Luke, uh, Matthew talk about appearance to the eleven. Paul talks about the appearance to the twelve. So right off, what I'm trying to say is the documents are saying different things. The first appearance is to the 12, it's to the 11, it's to the 10. The first appearance is on a mountain in Galilee. No, it's at a lake in Galilee. No, it's in a house in Jerusalem. And so Christians who have not studied the, the documents very carefully, they go to church on one Sunday and they, they have one version read to them. A year later they go for Easter, another version read to them. What I'm saying is if you look at them side by side, it's not as easy as I believe you're, you're yes. pointing out. Let's stop right here and look at this. The Gospel writers record ten appearances of the risen Lord. Five occur on the first Sunday, and five occur later on. Those that took place on the first Easter Sunday are Jesus' appearance to Mary Magdalene, to the other women, to Simon Peter, then to Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus and then to all of the disciples except Thomas. All of these resurrection appearances took place in Jerusalem except the one on the road to Emmaus. The five later appearances include Jesus' appearance to the whole number of disciples when Thomas was present one week later, his appearance to the seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee, to over 500 people on a mountain in Galilee, to James in Jerusalem, and then to the disciples the last time in Jerusalem and on Olivet. Thus there are two appearances in Galilee and the rest apparently in Jerusalem and vicinity. 
The ascension takes place at the end of 40 days in Bethany at the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem. Now, Mr. Nalen says the writers made a mistake in recording the number of disciples who saw Jesus. Matthew says the 11 proceeded to Galilee. Mark says Jesus appeared to the 11. Luke states, gathered together were the 11 and those who were with them. John merely states the disciples were present. Well, up to this point, none of the four writers disagree. But a few verses later, John records these words. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, three things need to be mentioned here. First, John doesn't say the apostles numbered twelve men when Jesus appeared. He simply says the disciples were present. Second, John shows us he uses the words the twelve to refer collectively to those members who were part of those called the Twelve, whether ten, eleven, or twelve of the apostles were actually present. Proof of this is in John 20, 24, where John identifies only ten apostles while yet referring to them as the Twelve. As everyone knew, Judas was dead, and John states that Thomas wasn't present. This would mean ten men were left, but John still refers to them collectively as the twelve. Later, John describes seven disciples at the Sea of Tiberias and refers to them only as the disciples. Now, Luke refers both to the eleven and to the twelve to indicate the apostolic body collectively. Proof of this is in Acts chapter 2, where Luke refers to the eleven, but in the passage itself, we discover not only are the original eleven apostles present, but the newly elected apostle is also present, which would total twelve men. In Luke 24, 33, Luke refers collectively to the eleven and then adds, there were others who were with them. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul refers to the apostles collectively as the twelve just as John and Luke do. It is evident that Paul and John's use of the twelve and Luke's use of the eleven are ways of referring to the apostolic body collectively rather than exact numerical computations. Thus, there is no conflict between the writers describing how many disciples were present. I think you have a real problem on the matter of the dating of the documents. Uh, you can't say simply that uh, Mark was the first of the Gospels and uh, Matthew and Luke uh, come later and then uh, John way later than that. Uh, that's one textual theory, but of course there are others. Uh, Goodspeed, for example, argued that uh, Matthew had priority. Uh, and uh, J.T. Robinson, a flaming liberal of the 1960s, finally came to the conclusion that the Gospel of John was actually the first Gospel. Uh, one thing is certain, all of these documents were in circulation within a generation of the events themselves. Uh, but it's not going to be possible, it seems to me, to establish such clean priorities in relation to the four Gospels that you can uh, get rid of Thomas uh, statements uh, as uh, coming in a Gospel that was written considerably later than the rest. You're simply going to have to face the uh, attribution of that incident uh, to Thomas. You're going to have to explain it in some fashion. Uh, Mr. Nalen, what I guess I've read in your article is that you would attribute uh, Thomas's statement to a, uh, a later edition of someone who, because of the attacks on Christianity, added to the Gospel of John and thought that that would help out in terms of the so-called ghost stories. And uh, therefore, you have said that uh, uh, it is uh, reasonable to believe that at a later time, uh, I, you can tell me what you think is a later time, uh, and what is the evidence for the fact of uh, assuming that that particular account is an add-on? How do you know that? Well, as I say again, I do not know that. I was not there. But to go back to what Dr. Montgomery was saying, obviously you can find scholars, hundreds of scholars, who will agree with any particular point of view. I mean, they're there's a scholar, which I'm sure you're familiar with, who says that Jesus never existed. Now, I think that's ridiculous, but 
He's a scholar, PhD, and he says that. But it is true that there is a scholarly, a mainstream opinion about the dating of the books. And you quote that mainstream opinion in your book, History and Christianity, page 34. And it, although later on you have a, a caveat that there are other scholars who put the documents older, or younger, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, that the documents do date, as, as I argue, with John uh, coming no later than 100. And oh, I, oh, heavens, I have no problem at all with saying that Mark was the earliest gospel and John was the latest. But that's not the point. The point is that the burden of proof rests upon you to show, number one, that John must be so late that when the account of Thomas is given, that account is unreliable. Now, the fact of the matter is that even if John is the latest of the Gospels, there is no difficulty at all in showing that it came from an eyewitness of the events, because we have external evidence of this. We have Papias, uh, who was a disciple of John, and we have Polycarp, who was a disciple of John, both stating that John was, in fact, the author of that Gospel. So we have an eyewitness saying that one of the original disciples had tactile, physical contact with the resurrected Christ. Uh, I think you've got a real problem there. You can't just get rid of that as some kind of later edition or uh, textual variant produced by drunken monks in the Middle Ages. Well, I think you have a real problem because what you're doing is you're quoting scholars who are in the minority. If, if you look... Oh, excuse me, but I was quoting primary sources. Papias and But it's Polycarp. not that simple because you have to look at the primary sources and what they said and what they really knew and what other people say. And all I, all I can say is that, for example, I have just looked at the Encyclopedia Britannica to see what it says. Oh, and that's not a primary source. Frankly, no, it was no, no. not being distributed in the first century. <laughs> I'm aware of that. But it is the standard English language encyclopedia, which attempts to summarize the knowledge of, of the Western world. And you can go to Encyclopedia Britannica, Harper's Bible Dictionary, the Oxford Annotated Bible, and they say that it is doubtful that John wrote John. Now, obviously, you can quote scholars who, who think that John did write John. Um, I think it's vital that we not simply try to uh, match authorities. Uh, it isn't a matter of uh, trying to find out how many contemporary theologians uh, believe that uh, Matthew came before Mark or Mark came before Matthew. It seems to me we have to cut behind the opinions of contemporary scholarship and certainly behind the Encyclopedia Britannica to the kinds of reasoning employed to reach conclusions here. And then, on the basis of the reasoning, we can legitimately draw our own conclusions. And I think we can see why contemporary scholarship has been tending in a certain direction. Uh, the uh, approach to take to these documents, and I think Mr. Nayland would entirely agree with this, needs to be the same kind of an approach that we would take with other historical documents. There isn't a special kind of historiography for the New Testament. Uh, the historiography is the same as we would apply to Roman uh, remains, uh, Greek remains, and so on down the line. And if we do this, we're going to have to determine, first of all, whether the texts as we have them have reached the present in substantially the condition in which they were originally written. That's the field of textual criticism. And here, there is no question but what, if we have reliable documents anywhere, we have them here. Uh, we have, for example, Sir Frederick Kenyon, who was the greatest of the textual critics uh, of uh, the last generation, uh, who said toward the end of his life, uh, the trouble here is not too few sound documents, it's too many, so that we have a considerable difficulty in knowing just what to do with so much good stuff. The uh, textual tradition takes us back uh, so that we can be quite sure that what we have today is what was originally written. Now, uh, when was it originally written? That takes us to the second question. Was this material contemporaneous with Jesus? Or was it written by uh, people at a later time and uh, presented as if it had been written by contemporaries? Well, uh, here again, what we have to do is to go to the sources, particularly to any external evidence of authorship. 
And the reason why uh, Albright uh, and uh, J.T. Robinson can't come to the conclusion that this stuff was all written within a generation of the events, all written by baptized Jews, the stuff was in circulation before the end of the century, uh, is that we have extrinsic statements from people who actually knew the apostles stating that the material was written by the people to whom uh, it was traditionally attributed. Uh, we have, as I mentioned before, Papias and Polycarp, both of them students of John, both of them stating that John wrote his gospel and giving us vital information on the production of the other gospels. For example, uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew's gospel, the first gospel, was written in Aramaic says Papias, uh, and uh, it was written by Matthew Levi, the tax collector, who was one of the original apostles. Uh, so we have Matthew's gospel and John's gospel definitely written by people who knew Jesus personally. We've got Mark's gospel written by John Mark, who was a companion of Peter, and we've got Luke's gospel written by a companion of Paul. And this is not based upon Encyclopedia Britannica or the opinion of some contemporary scholar. It's based upon those who claim that they actually did have contact with the apostolic circle. Now, this puts us in a very, very solid position historically to be able to evaluate the statements in these documents. Of course, uh, these people might have been engaged in some incredible fraud, but the burden of proof is going to rest upon us to show that, because documents like people should be considered innocent until proven guilty. But the historical reality is not that simple. Do you disagree that Matthew had a copy of Mark before him? Do you disagree with that? Or do I, you... I don't know for certain that he did, but I would have no You're... problems with okay. this. Uh, yep. be, uh, certainly Luke had source material. He declares that he did. He says that he used other materials relating to Jesus uh, in doing his own gospel. And it seems to me that when you look at the content of Luke and the content of Mark, you see that uh, one or the other used the other as a source. Okay, question for you. If, if Matthew had Mark before him, and scholars, most scholars believe that 606 of, Matthew, of Mark's 661 verses found their way into Mark. Give or in, take a verse. In, into Matthew, okay. So here is Matthew, who you believe was an eyewitness. He was at the Last Supper. If Matthew was at the Last Supper, why did he copy from Mark, who wasn't, the description of the Last Supper? Heavens, when I write up events in which I have participated, I inevitably try to get all of the stuff written by other people who were there or who had immediate contact with people who were there in order to incorporate that as best I can. That's the whole point of getting a comprehensive picture. Uh, Matthew, and Luke makes the point that, that he was so careful uh, in his own presentation of Jesus that he wanted to be sure that he had covered all of the other materials that were of importance. There's no difficulty in doing this uh, as long as you don't uh, try to uh, misalign or mishandle the material you're working with. Let me, let me put uh, Luke's statement on the board so we can actually see what the case is here. This is just uh, Luke chapter 1, uh, 1 through 4. Luke writes, many, which is interesting, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, namely the earthly career of Jesus just as they were handed down to us. So he's not the first guy. It, it, he had stuff coming down to him by those who from the first were eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses, he said, gave this information to him. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also for me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So it seems that he is saying that he's not the only one. He is drawing from other accounts, but he also checked them out because he wants to make sure that the account is certain. Now, is there anything wrong with that? Well, I'd like to go back just briefly to, to yes, Matthew go ahead. because there's, there's a difference between Mark and Luke, who were not eyewitnesses, to Matthew and John, who some, some scholars claim were. And I just, for the people watching this program, you know, ask yourself this question. If Matthew did write the book, which we call Matthew, and 
in the original text, it's not titled Matthew, we put that title on. If Matthew did write that, and if he was at the Last Supper and a hundred other events, then why did he copy word for word what Mark, who we know was not there, wrote? I mean, if uh, I... But, but hang on here. Mark was a companion of Peter. So what Mark right. is doing is providing Peter's perspective on this, and wouldn't Matthew be very much interested in what the chief of the apostles had to say about so those same saying, events? What you're saying is that when you do your autobiography and you're writing about your wedding, that you would rather have the usher at the wedding provide the information than you. As a matter of fact, when I have written up events in my own career, I have been very careful to get a hold of even the newspaper accounts of those same events, and I frequently cite them. What I want is to get the most comprehensive picture I possibly can. I can only be faulted if I pervert the data that I take from other people. And here again, the burden of proof is going to rest on you to okay. show that Matthew, in using Mark's material, if he did, uh, actually perverted it. Okay. Now, the fact that there is variation among these materials uh, is not the question. You say yourself in your article that one expects this kind of thing in reporting events. The important thing is the substance, what it actually has to say about the cruciality of an event such as the resurrection. All right, I, we thank you for joining us, and I hope that you will be there. Welcome to our program. Tonight we're going to be examining the questions, are the New Testament documents reliable? Who wrote them and when? Do the Gospel writers contradict each other in describing the different places that Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection? Let's get to our debate, and here's the very first question that I asked. One thing that you wrote in your article is that uh, besides saying we are dealing with accounts written not by eyewitnesses but by second generation Christians, when we got to Matthew you say we find the almost certainly false story of the tomb guards who became like dead men. And you go on to say if we dismiss this guard force from the historical record, if we dismiss it, we are left with the simple fact that Jesus' corpse was put to rest in a tomb that sat unguarded for approximately 36 hours, which is part of the basis that you go on to say that, yes, Joseph of Arimathea, he actually came and stole the body or took the body, put it someplace else, that's why the tomb was empty. But the only way you got to that conclusion was you dismissed the record in Matthew. And the fact is, as we were talking about the fact last week, if you find certain things that are copied over, you didn't like that. Now, here we've got Matthew who gives us information that you don't find in Mark, and you don't like that. Help me out here. Why okay. is it? Yes, I was interested in this. Uh, you had mentioned to me that you were in the military. What do you have against Roman guards? I mean, why are you eliminating these boys? <laughs> okay, let me give you an example. Okay. Suppose that instead of sitting in Chattanooga here tonight, you're in Africa, you're a Christian missionary in Africa. You don't have the morning New York Times, you don't have CBS Evening News, you don't have the radio. The only way you hear about outside events are through magazines. Okay, here it is, a couple months after the inauguration of President Bush, and you want to find out what the inaugural was like. You get, so here comes one morning bang. You get Time, Newsweek, U.S. News, National Review. Mm -hmm. You read Newsweek, uh, U.S. News, and National Review, and they talk about the inauguration. They say how President like Bush got up, he got dressed, he had breakfast, he went up Pennsylvania Avenue, went down Pennsylvania Avenue, Avenue, and they give the whole story, it makes sense. Then you read Time Magazine, and Time Magazine says that as President like Bush was driving up Pennsylvania Avenue, there was an earthquake, and the earth opened up, and fire came out, and now what would you think? If Time Magazine said something absolutely extraordinary that the other three didn't, would you say that, well, it probably happened, the other three just didn't mention it, or would you say it probably didn't happen because these other three sources don't mention it? And, of course, what I'm saying is that of the 26 books of the New Testament, specifically uh, Mark, Luke, and John, they do not mention these guards. And not only do they not mention them, uh, they present the events in such a way as the guards are precluded. Oh, no. not in the slightest. You, you suggest in your article that 
had the guards been there, the women could not have arrived at the tomb in the manner in which uh, the accounts say they did. But my gracious, this is a three-day period. Uh, if the guards had been frightened out of their wits uh, by uh, the resurrection, they would have taken off, and by Sunday morning, the women are there and there aren't any guards. It's, it's perfectly compatible. Uh, and since there isn't anything uh, that uh, goes against the cosmic order in having Roman guards around in a Roman province, uh, we don't have any possible metaphysical ground for excluding them from the account. Matthew, correct me if I'm wrong, says that the guards were there when the women arrived. Am I, am I incorrect? Or? Okay, so Matthew says the guards were there frozen as dead men when the women arrived. Now, John has Magdalene go to the tomb, leave. Peter go to the tomb, leave. Magdalene come back, leave. Mark and Luke have the women, various numbers of women, yeah, but, but come the women and go. came at different times. They didn't all come as, as a kind of committee. Uh, on one single uh, occasion in the course of so the, the guards events were, of Easter morning. You're saying the guards were gone by that time? Sure. Well, that's, that's not my understanding of Matthew. Surrounding Jesus' resurrection blend together perfectly. It starts this way. Very early on the Sunday morning of the resurrection, an earthquake took place. The angel descended and rolled away the stone, according to Matthew 28, 2 through 4. The guards at the tomb fled, Matthew 28, 11. A little later, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome hastened to the sepulcher while another group of women followed with the spices. Mary Magdalene reaches the sepulcher first, sees that it's empty, and immediately goes to inform Peter and John. You can find this in John chapter 20, verse 1. The other Mary and Salome approach and see the angel, Matthew 28, 5. Right after that, the other women with Joanna among them come along. They see the two angels and receive the message that Jesus has risen, Luke 24, 1. In the meantime, Mary Magdalene reaches Peter and John, and they hurry to the sepulcher, John 20. Mary also follows them again and arrives at the tomb after the others have already departed. She stops, begins to weep at the tomb, John 20, verse 2. She sees the two angels who ask her why she is weeping. After this, she sees Jesus himself, John 20, verse 14. In the meantime, the other women had gone to the other disciples and told them their experiences, but their words were regarded as idle tales, according to Luke 24, 11, until Peter and John confirmed them. When the other women were afterwards again on their way to the tomb, Jesus meets them, according to the true text of Matthew 28, 9, which simply reads, And behold, Jesus met them and said. Later in the day, the Savior appeared to Peter alone, according to Luke 24, 34, and 1 Corinthians 15, 5. And toward evening, Jesus appeared to the men of Emmaus, and a little later to the whole group of disciples, with the exception of Thomas, according to Luke 24, 36 through 43, and John 20, 19 through 24. A week later, Jesus again appeared to the disciples, but this time, Thomas was present, and he was convinced of the certainty of the resurrection, according to John chapter 20, verses 26 through 31. Then, during the 40 days before his ascension, the Lord also appeared in Galilee to the seven disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, according to John 21, 1 through 23 and later to the disciples in Galilee. Jesus also appeared to the 500 of his followers in Galilee as a result of the command of Mark 16, 7, as well as the reports that were coming out concerning Jesus' resurrection, and they assembled spontaneously in expectation of his appearance. When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15, 6, most of the 500 were still alive as living witnesses of the fact of the resurrection. From Acts 1, 3, and 4, we learn that during the 40 days before his ascension, Jesus often appeared to his followers and spoke to them about many things in order to prepare them as builders of his church. Toward the end of the 40 days, he no doubt commanded his followers to go to Jerusalem and remain there 
until his promise of the Holy Spirit falling upon them should be fulfilled. After their return to Judea, the Lord also appeared to James, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 7, and then to the apostles, Luke 24, 33 through 53, and Acts 1, 3 through 12. And then after his ascension, he appeared to Paul near Damascus, Acts 9, 3 through 6, and 1 Corinthians 15, 8. Also, Stephen, the first martyr, saw Jesus after his resurrection, according to Acts 7, 55. And last of all, the Lord also appeared to John, the gray-haired exile on the island of Patmos, according to Revelation 1, 10 through 19. I think that it can be shown that each of these accounts blends perfectly together. Why doesn't Mark, Luke, and John mention these guards if they were there? Heavens, who knows? I mean, anybody uh, recounting an event can put down the, the aspects of it that impress them and not put but down others. But this is the crucial question. The question that in antiquity the Jews were saying, oh, the disciples came and stole his body. So this is the crucial question. Was the tomb unguarded or was it guarded? Yeah. And only one person, the author of Matthew, whoever he was, says it was guarded. Uh, and that was a Papias late account. thought it was the apostle. Uh, but I, I, think, I think what you're saying is that if you had been Matthew, you would have, you would have added a few more things. Okay? It's like well, me when I'm reading the What does gospel book? mean? Gospel means, it means good, good news. news. It doesn't mean the good news and the bad news. It means the good news. Uh, but so good, it, good news is not the equivalent to the encyclopedia that gives all data possible on any given subject. No, good news means here's the good news. We're not going to talk about the bad news. Well, the, wait a minute. No, no. <laughs> what it means is the good news that God came to earth in Jesus Christ, died on the cross, and rose again. It doesn't mean that each gospel writer has the obligation to include every piece of information every other gospel writer includes but you would include the crucial events yes but it's only you you who thinks that it's crucial that every gospel writer include the same amount of information concerning the Roman guards you don't think it's crucial that the guards were guarding the tomb it very crucial but all you need is one eyewitness to tell you that they were there you there, and we, we have four and three don't mention it well for heaven's sake you, you've got only two gospels that even mention the Sermon on the Mount now, I don't know anyone who doubts that Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. Why is it that Mark and John don't mention uh, those particular items of preaching? Answer, because they were interested in other things. And each writer has the perfect right to be interested in what he wants to write about as long as he's accurate in what he says. You've got to take these writings as complementary. Uh, you can't set up a statistical system whereby you've got to have, you know, eight of the X number of New Testament writers saying the same thing on any given subject, you can throw it out. That kind of criterion we'd never apply in any other area of life. But if one out of 26 says it, and the others... Ah, uh, but hang on, that's, that's, that's uh, uh, a poor statistic anyway, because you've only got four of these writers who are giving out okay. of these events. And that's so you all. have 25%. Uh, sure, which is just fine. You go into any court of law, you'll find that when four witnesses describe a traffic accident, you will get information from uh, A that you will not get from B, C, and D. You'll get information from C you won't get from A, B, and D. And no judge would ever instruct a jury to ignore what one of them says simply because the others haven't said the same thing. And, uh, Mr. Nalen, you and your article have said that there is contradictory conclusions that discounts the evidence that is given. And I'd like to take one that is the basic uh, premise of uh, this article, namely, what happened to the body? Obviously, everybody agrees that the tomb was empty. Now, uh, what happened to the body? The disciples said, Jesus arose, they saw him, that's why it's empty. Uh, others down through history have come up with other conclusions that uh, some have said it will take more faith to believe that than what the disciples actually testified to. Your conclusion that you have come to is found in your article, and it, you say this. If it is true that Joseph of Arimathea was a pious Jew who out of human kindness and not Christian loyalty hurriedly interred the lifeless body of Jesus in his own tomb, it is also possible that when the Sabbath ended at sundown on Saturday, Joseph's servants removed Jesus' body and deposited it in a less imposing final resting place. Now, 
That's your conclusion, but you have to wrestle with the actual eyewitness accounts themselves, and this is one of them. It says in John chapter 19, later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had earlier visited Jesus at night. It's John 3. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, you go against that statement that John wrote. Please tell us why you came to your conclusion. Okay, well, we have to start with the question was, was Joseph of Arimathea a disciple or follower of Jesus or not? And you quoted John, a late source. But he's a good deal earlier than you are. That's correct. But Luke and Mark are earlier than he is. And Luke and Mark do not present Joseph as a follower of Jesus. Do they state that Joseph of Arimathea was not a disciple? If they did, then you'd have a contradiction between uh, their accounts and the account uh, just read by Mr. Ankerberg. All right. Let me quote, let me quote Luke for you. All right. that, should, that should suffice. That Joseph was a good and righteous man who had not consented to their purpose and deed, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. And Mark, actually it's reversed. Mark says it and Luke copies it looking for the kingdom of God. Now, that does not say that he was a disciple of Jesus. And well, my question let me, is... Let me challenge you. John one one question. Okay. Joseph of Arimathea, member of the count, Supreme Council of the Jews, if he was a follower of Jesus, what happened to him? Well, let me, let me answer both those for you. Okay? Why isn't he later on in Acts? As, well, as the well let, me, let me see if we can, we what can discuss What happened to Pontius them. Pilate? What happened to Joseph and Mary? There are a lot of... Well, exactly. And you can't judge history by whether or not the accounts give you a complete biographical description of the career of every person mentioned. But it would seem to me, and I could be incorrect, that if Joseph was a follower of Jesus, he would have been the most influential early follower of Jesus. For heaven's sake, maybe he had a heart attack two weeks after the resurrection. I mean, there are a thousand explanations that are possible for this. The point is that none of the accounts would deny what John said, that he was a secret follower of Jesus. But why don't they state it then? I don't know. Well, I, I think I know. It. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, here we've got to be very careful, because there is a certain element of presumptuousness, in my opinion, in your article. You seem to be sure as to how these accounts ought to have been written. Now, uh, of course, had you written them, you would have included material or excluded material that the writers didn't. But that may be the reason why God didn't choose you to write the article. <laughs> well, I wasn't around then. So. Exactly, exactly. And so as a historian, what we need to do is to go with what the stuff says unless we have solid and indeed better reason contemporaneously for not going along with it. And here we have John, who according to his own students, was an eyewitness to these events stating that Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple. Also, John, uh, Mr. Nalen, you also have, in the fact, you have two witnesses here, because in Matthew, he says, as evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Now, the fact is, here you've got two witnesses that say the same thing, and a man that's on the council, we can all understand the fact that on the council, he had a lot to lose when they just killed off the person that he is secretly following. At the same time, the evidence that you read in Luke, it, where it says, uh, now there's a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. And the fact that he did not consent to the whole council's action, there's got to be a pretty good reason why. And that flows with John's account and Matthew's account, the reason why. 
He was a disciple. Well, let, the reason why was that he was a pious Jew, and the Romans were, the Roman Empire was not a pretty thing. The Romans were, were vicious, barbarian pagans. And here you have this Jew, Jesus, who was being crucified by the Romans, put up over the Sabbath, is what they wanted, and, and Joseph, my understanding, as a pious Jew, just could not stand for that. And he well, that, that may well be right. That may very well be right. But the point is that the primary accounts, the first-hand testimony, goes beyond that and says, also, he was a secret disciple, and he took down the body and did those various things with it. But let's take the worst possible scenario. Let's say that uh, his servants, by his command, uh, took the body off someplace. The problem that you've got there is that, as the account also says, Nicodemus was privy to this, and obviously other people in those circles would be privy to it, uh, and these events occurred as public events of that time. Uh, everybody was interested in them. Uh, to, to think that he could have somehow, or his servants could somehow have gotten away with stashing that body with all of the interest groups involved in the situation uh, really requires more faith than the resurrection does. You, you just can't explain it away that way. Uh, it was uh, Morrison in his book, Who Moved the Stone, that pointed out that if you're going to doubt the resurrection of Christ, you really got to provide a clean, satisfactory explanation of what happened to this body. And uh, the uh, Joseph of Arimathea explanation is getting you into more hot water than I think you want to get into. I'm ready. Just give me a second. Okay. Uh, a, a final statement, because we're out of time for this week, and we want to move on. Where do you think the evidence? Because what we have said is that you have two witnesses that make a blanket statement, and you have another that really does not contradict it, and yet you want to go a different direction than the material, uh, a concluding statement. Okay. If you agree. If you agree with the main scholars who say that, that Mark is the oldest, and you see that Luke and Matthew are later and John is even later, Mark does not say anything about the guards. He doesn't say anything about uh, uh, Joseph being a disciple of Jesus. And later on, as the, Christian, the young Christian religion is growing and people are fighting it, and they're saying it was just a ghost story and all these things, then you get the later accounts written by people trying to convince others of the reality of the risen Jesus. And human nature is that you put the best foot forward, and maybe you add a little more than, than you've received. Yeah, but you don't put your best foot forward when set off. Uh, and the fact of the matter is that all of this stuff, Mark, Matthew, Luke, all of this stuff was circulating among hostile witnesses, among people who had the means, the motive, and the opportunity to blast it if this stuff was not set forth satisfactorily. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce of the University of Manchester has made the very strong point that uh, really the presence of the hostile witnesses turns out to be the legal equivalent of cross-examination. There's no way in the world that they could have gotten away with this, even if you're right that they introduced it as a kind of, of, of subsequent explanation so as to put their best foot forward. How it, could we hear well, We're out of time now. this week, guys. Just finish that up, and we'll pick it up again next week. Well, I, I was simply going to make the point that, that the, uh, the disciples, the very people who wrote this stuff, had the temerity the stupidity to go to the Jewish synagogues to present this. Uh, that would have been the worst thing to do if Mr. Dalen was right and that the uh, stuff had been added later in order to make the story look better. Because in the Jewish synagogues were the rabbis, J the Jewish religious leaders that had come in from the diaspora and had been present, many of them, at the time these very events had transpired. All right. Let's take an example, say Mark II. I think most people know that. And let's take that as we come back next week and we'll talk about fantastic statements that Jesus made in the presence of hostile witnesses and the effect of whether or not we can tell we have accurate information by just putting those together. Please join me next week. I think you'll find it interesting. Welcome. We're glad that you joined us. We are talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And a lot of people want to know, why would anybody talk about that? Well, if it actually took place, and if there's evidence, intellectual, historical evidence, that would point a person 
to believe that you should believe that force you to that conclusion, then you have a basis for resurrections and life after death and all that that's involved. And Jesus Christ would be the authoritative spokesman that would be able to speak about that. No other religious leader in history ever made such a claim as to conquer death, come back to life, and tell us about it. Now, Jesus Christ did. We are saying, though, did it happen in history? And we've been talking about the fact of, do we have accurate information in the New Testament documents? And how do we evaluate that? And part of it would also be, did Jesus ever claim that he was God? Mr. Nayland, do you think that Jesus ever claimed he was God according to the documents you've read? This is a very complicated subject, but I'd say probably. But it's, it's not something that I think I'm an expert in. Okay. Dr. Montgomery, what do you think? Oh, no question about it. Give us an example from the documents. Well, it seems to me you mentioned last week a uh, passage in Mark chapter 2. Uh, Mr. Nayland has placed great emphasis on Mark as the first of the Gospels, so this would certainly be of significance to him. Uh, in Mark 2, which is the first description of a day in Jesus' public ministry, uh, there is a paralytic lowered down through the roof, uh, and uh, Jesus says uh, to the paralytic, your sins be forgiven. Hmm? And uh, the text says that uh, the religious leaders standing around began, began murmuring, who can forgive sin but God only? Jesus doesn't say, oops, uh, you're perfectly right, uh, slip of the tongue. Uh, he says, uh, which is it easier to say, uh, your sins be forgiven or take up your bed and walk? He says to the paralytic, take up your bed and walk. Hmm? Paralytic does this and goes forth. And the account says, and as a result of this, people believed in Jesus, what he was claiming for himself. The logic of it was, of course, that no one could see whether the paralytic sins had been forgiven. That wasn't a visible consideration. But they could certainly tell uh, whether he was leaping around on his own two legs or not. And so uh, Jesus succeeding in the one gave evidence of the other. And the obvious point of this at the beginning of the gospel is to say, this man was more than a man. He, at least he claimed to be more than a man, and people believed it on the basis of empirical evidence of what he did. Okay, excellent point. Now, when, people, when some people talk about Jesus, they talk about Jesus as though only one person in world history has been claimed to have done miracles. Let me, let me read one thing to you. Just indulge me for a second. In the first century of the Common Era, there appeared in the eastern end of the Mediterranean a remarkable religious leader who was said to have worked miracles, casting out demons, healing the sick, and raising a girl from the dead. His followers claimed that he was the son of God. Accused of sedition against Rome, he was arrested. After his death, his followers claimed that he had risen from the dead, had appeared to them to prove that he, had, he lived yet, and then ascended to heaven. Now, who is this religious, uh, who is this religious leader? Was it Jesus? No. It was uh, Apollonius of Tyana. Well, if you'll pardon my saying so, that is a reconstruction of his life to make his life appear very much like Jesus. There were some similarity of claims, but the parallelism is not that strong. Even if it were, however, the issue really is not whether one claims this, but whether one can back it up with sufficient evidence. Well, and in the case of Apollonius of Tyana, we have absolutely no primary source data to show that as a matter of fact, he did those things, uh, and uh, therefore this is little more than a father divine in New York a few years ago saying, I'm God. Uh, a few years later, a very tragic thing happened. God died there in New York. Okay, um, if, if you don't like that one, most of what we know about a certain period of the Roman Empire... It isn't that I don't like it, it's just non-historical. Okay, let's go to one that maybe will be. Most of what we know about a certain period of the Roman Empire, the Roman Republic, comes from Tacitus. He is, I mean, if we didn't have Tacitus, we wouldn't know half of what we know, or what we think we know. And Tacitus records two miracles, and they weren't done by Jesus, they were done by Roman emperors. If you read Livy and other Roman historians, they record, they record miracles, they record beings with one eye, they record all sorts of stuff, which didn't My uncle place. Alfonso has only one eye. No. Uh, but in the center of the head. <laughs> oh, oh, Cyclops. oh, oh, I see. I, Cyclops. Yes, I, I, I knew you meant that. Yes, the, the fact that classical writers record other miracles also, it seems to me, doesn't cut any ice in reference to our discussion. Why not? Be because 
We're not arguing, or at least I'm not arguing, that merely because a miracle occurs, that necessarily satisfies the claims of the one providing the miracle. It depends upon the nature of the miracle. Uh, if, for example, I were to come here uh, with uh, a billiard ball uh, and uh, miraculously grow hair on it, I don't think it would produce a religious revival. Uh, the reason being that this, well, perhaps among billiard balls, <laughs> Uh, who, who don't like to be bald. Uh, but among human beings, this kind of thing is not going to touch the wellsprings of their existence. It's not going to reach them at the points of, of, of greatest need. If, however, Jesus actually was able to rise from the dead, to conquer the powers of death, that says something to every person. Sure and, would. And, right. Uh, and, and therefore, that sort of thing, we've really got to look at very, very closely. Uh, in other words, if you come across somebody who rises again from the dead, and you ask him, how come? And he says, it's because I'm God. You're never going to get a better reason for worship. Correct. All right? Okay. Well, we're trying to determine whether that was the situation relative to Jesus Christ. Correct. Uh, what was the evidence that Jesus gave for his claim that would verify it to the people of his own day that might stand today? What's the evidence? Interesting that in Mr. Nalen's article, there is that beginning section in which he talks about the failure of Jesus' career. Uh, I believe it, it has that, that wonderful line in it, uh, poor Jesus of Nazareth. He did everything he could, but he, it, things just didn't work out. Uh, and uh, I wonder if uh, perhaps that doesn't come about as a result of a certain selectivity of data, because Jesus predicts his resurrection from the dead, he speaks of himself as God, and the ultimate success of what he's doing relates to that. Uh, he says, uh, tear down this temple, referring to his body, and in three days I'll build it again and uh, only one sign will be given to this wicked and perverse generation, the sign of Jonah, as he was in the beast, so I will be in the earth and will rise again. And the accounts say that after the resurrection, people remembered what he had said in that respect uh, and, uh, and believed in him. What you, what you have here is uh, a, a person who claims all the way through his ministry that he is God Almighty, and he then points to the resurrection as the key factor for establishing this. And this brings the thing, it seems to me, totally out of the realm of Fatima visions and other uh, fascinating phenomena that you were alluding to earlier. Uh, if this turned out to be true, it would in fact the, the ultimate issue of salvation. Uh, which uh, presumably is uh, what uh, all of us are worried about or would very much like to get taken care of in all our right. own Let's take existence. a break, and uh, we're out of time right now, but let's uh, pick this up in just a moment. We'll be right back. All right, we're back, and we're talking about the resurrection. Is there solid evidence in history for the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Does it make a difference to you? This is not just an intellectual exercise. If, it act, if there's evidence in real history that this actually took place, then we have a figure in history that has done something that no other person in the world has done, come back from the dead. And that one says that he is the life, he is the resurrection, and he can give us life and he can forgive our sins. We need to listen to him. That's proof. Now, do we have that in religion? That's what we're talking about. And uh, Mr. Nalen, you said in your article that Jesus' ministry apparently ended in failure. Five reasons why. Jesus was doubted by his own family. They thought he was insane. Own disciples sometimes doubted him because of his teachings. Some people withdrew from him. Jesus' own neighbors in his own hometown rejected him. I find it interesting that, uh, that you didn't conclude what the documents conclude of why, though, in each case. Jesus was doubted by his own family. Yeah, if my brother said he was God, I'd have doubts too. And uh, James said he wouldn't believe him, but it's interesting that he became one of the leaders in Jerusalem, why? What pulled him kicking and screaming over the line after he says, hey, my brother's nuts? It was evidence, and his brother came back from the dead, is what, what the record says. Uh, his own disciples sometimes doubted things. Yeah, Jesus was rugged. He said he was God. He had all authority. Uh, Jesus' neighbors in his own hometown, they liked him, but they didn't like the fact that he kept on saying that he was God and was the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. So the question is, is not the fact of during his life did Jesus come into conflict, but it seems like the very conflict shows that the people and the religious leaders knew what Jesus was saying, namely that he was God. 
think it's in John 10, Jesus said, hey, why is it you want to stone me? And they said, because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. So they understood. Now the question is, did Jesus pull off giving the evidence for his claims? Namely, he told these people he was going toward Jerusalem, he would be crucified, and on the third day he'd come forth from the grave. Did he? The eyewitnesses said that after they watched him murdered on the cross with thousands of other people, that he actually appeared to them. Now we come into Thomas. Now we come into Peter. Now we come into the Apostle John. And uh, uh, maybe I'm, I'm drawing the argument along here, but uh, the Apostle Paul. And what you do is in 1 Corinthians 15, you say, Paul lists all these people. Boom, boom, boom. And uh, finally comes to the end after he goes through uh, even 500 people and says, and finally he appeared to me. But you say, really, it wasn't an objective, physical resurrection that uh, Jesus appeared in a body to Paul, but just in a straight vision. Therefore, all the rest are like that, too. Uh, tell me a little bit more about your conclusion. There's a wonderful passage here. Would you permit me to quote you? I have no choice. What could have caused, <laughs> what could have caused Paul's vision? Common sense suggests several possibilities. Incidentally, common sense is a very poor guide. Uh, I had a professor of philosophy, Max Black, who said, any time anyone says, obviously, it isn't. <laughs> What's that Common sense suggests several possibilities. It is possible that Paul suffered from an organic disease such as epilepsy, which would account for his collapse. He might be referring to this malady when he wrote, a thorn was given me in the flesh. It also could have been um, uh, falling hair. Uh, I mean, there is no indication in the account at all as to what the disease was, but uh, suddenly it's epilepsy. All right? Or perhaps the heat and exertion of a walking journey under the midday sun in the Middle East could have led to a heat stroke. Um, Happened I, to Martin Luther. Oh, oh, no, not at all. It wasn't a heat stroke. It was a lightning storm. But anyway, uh, to, to my way of thinking, this is so terribly speculative. It is just speculative. There is no possible way to establish anything like that. Correct. Well... Then why I do you wasn't there. You weren't there. Aha. Uh -huh. right. Some people act like they were. Ah, right. The people who some modern people. That's right. Act like they that's were. right. And and they're wrong, aren't they? They certainly shouldn't give that sort of an impression. But it seems to me that unlike you and me who weren't there, we've got Paul who was there. And Paul describes his experience on the Damascus Road and his companion, the physician Luke describes it also in two places in the book of Acts. And so out of this, we find that this thing was certainly not a fig Newton of Paul's imagination. This was not a matter of pure subjectivity. But what does Acts say? Does it say his followers saw nothing? Oh, no. Followers did not see Jesus. Ah, no. They saw a light. Careful. But by the way, do you read Greek? Do you handle the no, Greek New Testament? Not. Okay, not. I wondered, because in a footnote your article footnote 85 you say that's my uh, favorite footnote th yes it is i thought it would be yes th that uh, that acts uh, 9 and acts 22 contain bizarre contradictions in dealing with the same thing do you know on the basis of the greek there's no contradiction at all there what the text says is that the people with paul were not able to make out the person who was there but they saw a man right they saw light huh and oh, which is it it's light. Okay. It's light. They Careful. saw light, but they were not able to make out the person, the individual. What did, what did they hear? Did they hear the voice? Ah, they heard sound, but they were not able to make out the words. That's the distinction between akuain followed by the genitive and akuain followed by the accusative in those two passages. Uh, this is a clear distinction between hearing sound and making out specific words. So uh, the, uh, the point of those passages is that even the people with Paul were directly affect Paul. So you can't very well say that this was uh, a vision that he created out of, uh, maybe he had had poor hot tamales for lunch uh, before this had occurred. But you and Mr. Ankerberg keep talking like we could go back and pick up the old uh, cable news network tape of what actually happened. No, no. Or we could go back and pick up the old New York Times edition no, no, that morning and, no, and see what actually happened. No, merely Paul's own writing and that of his immediate companion, the tanto to his lone ranger, namely Luke. Okay, why does Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 not give details? Not he gives say, plenty of details. He says Jesus appeared to this person, that person, and this group of people. It doesn't say what order. 
Some well, scholars believe he didn't say because he didn't know. Uh, well, uh, again, Mr. Nalen, we can't second-guess a writer. Uh, you, you cannot demand that a writer give the detail that you would like to have him give at a particular point. The question isn't what he might have said, it's whether what he did say actually occurred. All himself was there, he's in a much more advantageous position than you or me. And when he goes on in 1 Corinthians, after listing these witnesses, and talks about the nature of the resurrection, he uses the word in Greek, body, again and again. He talks about a spiritual body. You give the impression that uh, he was uh, talking about a sort of uh, a spirit flitting around and that this could be purely subject and visionary. But Paul stresses soma, the word body, throughout that entire passage. And the reason is that for Jews, the disembodied soul was uh, an impossible idea. Paul, if he were talking about any resurrection, was certainly talking about a bodily resurrection to correlate it with the general resurrection at the end of time, which is bodily, after all. Mr. Nalen, also, would it make sense that uh, if this came out around 55 A.D., that uh, you have people that are very vocal and visible that he's naming? Peter was not in hiding. Uh, the other apostles were out standing in these cities saying the same thing. And he was, he was merely reporting, listen, go over to this city or even here, you'll see these men, check it out. Or possibly even people in Corinth themselves. These people were well known and still alive that he was quoting. And uh, I think that uh, as such, that put them on the hot seat. Also, you also, I think, in the Gospels have the fact that uh, places where the appearances came were mentioned. People that were there were mentioned again. So it's not Paul? like he's saying these things in a vacuum. Okay, but Does you're that make sense? Some. <laughs> you're talking as though if, if I was a skeptic, if I was a Jew yes. or a pagan or whatever living 2,000 years ago, that if I went and checked out these things, that I could write it down and have it survive to today. Right on! How, right could, on. how could I, when in 312, when Constantine... Uh, the conversion of Constantine, the Roman, the uh, Roman Catholic, the Catholic, the uh, Christian religion became the dominant religion, and all of the, the official books, religion of the Roman Empire. All of yes. the books were burned. No, they were burned. Yes. What do you mean, all the books? No, not not the books of all Jews, for goodness' sake. No, but okay, take Celsus, the, what, what, the we, early we opponent have, we have, of. We, yes, but wait a minute. We have a tremendous quantity of Jewish literature from that early period that survived in the Middle Ages, and there was no systematic. Uh, decimation of Jewish writings and it was the Jews who had the primary interest in this and the Jewish religious leaders who had brought about uh, many of the events that we're talking about who had the means motive and opportunity to destroy this if, if they had, again, had any evidence. what we're doing is we're reading the importance of this is issue today back into time and if you read Josephus who writes about events of this time you see there are miracle workers everywhere all over Palestine so why would... They're miracle claimants. I think Josephus is one who said that some claimed, and uh, in the documents themselves, I think the ones that I remember they said, guy went out and said, part Jordan seven times, it didn't part, and they stoned him. They had a well, that, was party. that was Thutis. That was Thutis, the pseudo-Messiah. And, of course, there were people who went out and said things like that, but there was quite a difference between Thutis, who huffed and puffed on the banks of the Jordan, nothing happened, and the Romans came in and cleaned him up, uh, and Jesus... Well, the Romans came in and, and crucified Jesus. Ah, but then we have the little matter of the resurrection, which, don't we? Which is the subject of our focus, uh, and for which the primary witnesses assert facticity. Okay, final statement, uh, Mr. Nalen, and then Dr. Montgomery. I defer to you. Oh, no. <laughs> Does this make sense, but what you are I, hearing? I, because this is, this is not just an intellectual argument. Uh, we well, this is an incredibly crucial question, because, yes. you know, if I'm wrong, there's certain things that are going to happen to me. Yes, and Obviously. I appreciated you saying at the, at the very front of, the arg of, the ar of your article that it was of primary importance because we couldn't agree more. It, what I want to know is the, is the evidence bringing you toward different conclusions. I look at the world today. Because I work for the, the Department of State, I look at the whole world, not just the Christian part. And according to uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, 32 point... <laughs> 32.8% of the human beings on this planet today are Christians. 
and that's kind of a vague definition of Christians that includes a lot of people. Do you know in the, middle, so after, in the, in the middle Ages, 100% of the people believed that the sun went around the earth. They were all wrong. That's correct. So, it is, so what, what you're saying is that after 2,000 years, that this shining truth has only been able to convince 32.8% of the people of this planet. Did and at that progression, it'll be 6,000 years before you get everyone. Well, my goodness. And, it, I, and it, the it, reason I think that's the case is that because there are all these religions out there, and they all have the same truth value, which is Okay, I, I agree, well. Mr. Dale. And the question would be, though, is let's say we're going that direction. The only reason we're going to go that direction, and you ought to be the first to hop on board and become part of the new statistics, is if there's evidence. Right. And, if, and that's what we want to know, is not how many haven't yet accepted it, because there's a lot of people listening tonight that may accept it simply on the evidence alone. We, there was a time when I had to do it, and I looked at the evidence and felt compelled that, that there was no other choice. Jesus was who he claimed to be and gave evidence. Yeah, that, that, that was my situation also. I went to university as a garden variety 20th century pagan, and as a result of uh, being forced for intellectual integrity's sake to check out this evidence, I finally came around. I, I think often of the statement of Pascal. This will have to be the last statement because we're out of time. Go. All right, good for Pascal as a last statement. Uh, <laughs> said Pascal, there is enough light to to convince anyone who's willing to check it out. And there is enough obscurity that no one has to accept it if he doesn't want to. So it seems to me that uh, Mr. Nalen's approach here will eventually lead him in a different direction. All right, we're going to uh, pick this up again next week, and I hope that you'll join us. Welcome. During this part of our debate, you will hear three questions many non-Christians ask about the resurrection accounts. First, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who went to the tomb on Easter morning, and when did they go? Second, after Jesus' resurrection, do the accounts contradict each other in stating where he appeared to his disciples? Matthew, Mark, and Luke contradict each other in reporting the message the angels gave concerning Galilee? Now, of these three questions, let's begin with the first. Here's how our guest, Mr. John K. Nalen, put it during the debate. As I said in a previous program, the problem is, in this case, from the Christian point of view, we have too many facts. Okay, the first question, who went to the tomb? Was it Mary Magdalene alone? Was it Mary Magdalene with another woman? Was it Mary Magdalene with three women? Was it Mary Magdalene with five women? Now, let's examine this. The critics cannot see any way to harmonize four concerning who came to the tomb Easter morning. Those passages are Matthew 28, 1, where Matthew states, After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Mark reports one more woman visited the tomb, for we read in Mark chapter 16, 1 and 2, When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Luke reports in his book, chapter 24 and verse 1, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. And finally, in John chapter 20, verse 1, the apostle John writes, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Reading these accounts, the critics conclude that the writers contradicted each other concerning the number of women who went to the tomb. Matthew mentions two women, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Mark mentions three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome. Luke simply mentions the women in general. Well, John mentions only one woman, Mary Magdalene. Now, the critics believe there is no way to harmonize these four accounts. But notice, none of the Gospel writers say it was just one woman, or only two women, or only three women who went to the tomb. Each writer describes those he wants to recognize, either because of a specific emphasis he has, or because that is all the information he knows. If one of the four writers had said, only so-and-so went to the tomb, and another writer said only somebody else specifically went to the tomb, then we would have a contradiction. 
Now, in writing our letters today, we describe people the same way the gospel writers did back then. Suppose after a day-long family gathering, your grandmother, mother, and sister all write a letter to your brother at college describing what happened at a birthday party. In writing about the party, probably your grandmother would say something like, I was so glad Sue's family and Tom's family were able to come to the party. Whereas your mother in her letter would probably write a little more specifically, identifying both the husband and the wife. For example, she might write, Sue and Jim were there, Tom and Karen came later. But even then, your mother probably wouldn't mention all the children that came to the party. Finally, your sister in her letter would probably mention nothing about the adults or little kids but concentrate only on describing the dates that the other cousins had brought to the party. Now the brother in receiving the three different letters at college would not expect his grandmother, mother, or sister to each list all the individual people present at the party before making their general comments. So why do the critics insist the disciples must do so in their accounts? The Gospel writers are not giving a complete description of every single person that went to the tomb, but only those persons they think important to mention in describing what happened when Jesus arose from the dead. Can their accounts be harmonized just the way they stand? The answer is yes. Here is just one way to do so. Probably all five of the women mentioned in the accounts planned Saturday night to meet at Jesus' tomb on Sunday morning. Early Sunday morning, each of them leave their homes at approximately the same time. Mary arrives first, just a bit ahead of her friends. She sees that the stone is rolled away and that the tomb is empty, and immediately decides to run and tell Peter and John. She leaves before her friends arrive. Now if this happened, John would be correct in reporting that Mary had reached the tomb first. Luke, in talking generally about all the women, Matthew choosing to refer to two of the women, and Mark choosing to identify three of the women going to the tomb on Sunday morning, would also be correct. This way, all the accounts would agree and complement each other. But next, the critics allege that the writers contradicted each other in reporting the specific time the women went to the tomb. Matthew says the women went at dawn while Mark says they went very early, just after sunrise. The critics insist this is a contradiction, but the words at dawn include just after sunrise. If you say you went to the beach at dawn, those hearing you would understand you were talking about any time from several minutes before sunrise till several minutes after sunrise. There is no contradiction between Matthew and Mark. But then, the critics charge that Luke disagrees with Matthew and Mark because he states it was very early in the morning, not at dawn or just after sunrise. But doesn't very early in the morning include dawn and just after sunrise, the very descriptions given by both Matthew and Mark? When one gets up very early in the morning, this can include a significant span of time, certainly at least half an hour before dawn until just after sunrise. Therefore, Luke does not contradict anything Matthew or Mark says. But finally, the critics charge, John certainly contradicts the others. John states, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. How can this phrase be compatible with at dawn or just after sunrise? Well, consider the normal use of language. While it was still dark, can describe conditions that exist at dawn. Anyone who has been up at dawn certainly knows it is not the full light of day. In fact, you know that depending on the weather conditions, it can be quite dark when the dawn is just breaking or just after sunrise. Also, keep in mind that each gospel writer does not tell us whether he is describing the period of time at which the women left their houses or that period of time in which they were traveling from their houses to the tomb, or the point in time when they actually were arriving at the tomb. We will get a consistent and coherent picture if we allow the first departures of the women as being in the dark and the last arrivals as being before full sunrise. 
In conclusion, whether we are considering the number of women at the tomb or the time at which it was said they went to the tomb, it is clear that there is no contradiction between the gospel accounts. They complement each other. As I said in a previous program, the problem is, in this case, from the Christian point of view, we have too many facts. Okay, the first question, who went to the tomb? Was it Mary Magdalene alone? Was it Mary Magdalene with another woman? Was it Mary Magdalene with three women? Was it Mary Magdalene with five women? Uh, all of the personages mentioned in those accounts were there at one time or another. It must have been a pretty busy scene with people going back and forth. It, it undoubtedly was. Did, did uh, Mary, did, did Peter go to the tomb? As far as we know, yes. You see, I could run through this whole permutation here, but... But, but you yourself have made it unnecessary to do this because you've said in your article that uh, even though there may be some difficulty in recon reconciling the details, there obviously is something behind this. Uh, you've said that uh, the experiences that these disciples had certainly point to something veridical that brought the whole thing about. So you mustn't go back and get bogged down okay. in the question let's, of details. Let's go forward then. Okay. What, what I've written in there is that the only thing the sources disagree on is who, when, where, and how, which is quite a bit. They, they disagree, they agree on what? That someone experienced the risen Jesus. But they totally disagree on who it was, when it was, uh, where it was. Uh, excuse me, that is in your phraseology. What the accounts agree upon is that he rose again from the dead. You have translated this into that people had an experience of. The, the accounts do not present it subjectively. The accounts present it objectively. In fact, they see the disciples as going back to fishing, totally discouraged, and it's only as a result of the impact of the resurrection that they come around and they become the missionaries that uh, okay. turned the Roman world upside down. Listen, I got you right here. Okay, you, you admit that at least one of the authors says that the disciples went back to Galilee to continue their previous occupations. Sure, and they're confronted okay. by Jesus there. So that was the first time he appeared to them. Or was oh, it Jerusalem? heavens, I don't know whether it's the first time or well, the second see here, time. See, one book says no he appeared on Easter in Jerusalem. But, but you see, these are complementary. That is to say, there's no reason why the risen Jesus couldn't have turned up in Cleveland if okay. he wanted to. I mean, but, he, he can turn up in Galilee as well as in Jerusalem. But if he, I, I don't know in what order he turned up in the two places. Well, the, the Gospels try to tell us, and one says that he appeared on Easter, the day of the, the resurrection, in Jerusalem. Fine, no okay, problem. But then, why would they go back to Galilee and start fishing again? I have no idea. The reason you have no idea is because you are not able to properly read the Gospels because you have this fixed view. Uh, to the contrary, my view is that you've got at least 11 apostles okay. plus a whole slew of other disciples. And it doesn't, uh, isn't required in the least to say that all of them were there in Jerusalem at one point. Jesus saw them all, and therefore there was no reason for any of them to go off to Galilee. The fact is, some went to Galilee, some stayed there. Jesus appeared to both of, of them and maybe to, to many others who were in different places. You see, you're reading this, and you'll pardon my saying so, in a wooden fundamentalist manner. Uh, I'm trying to take these accounts as one would take uh, several accounts of any event uh, as, as given by a, a number of witnesses. And so, of course, they're going to be describing different groups under different circumstances. They are complementary. They are not contradictory, okay. and they, none of them is complete. On, uh, on the post-crucifixion appearances as they're recorded, you make a dichotomy, you make a differentiation between uh, the Jerusalem appearances, in other words, where Jesus is said to have appeared in Jerusalem to his disciples, and that uh, about uh, in uh, Galilee. And you actually said, and uh, I want you to tell me why you said, this author... Uh, referring to uh, Luke, and uh, actually reworked a key section of his received source material in order to delete any hint of a Galilean appearance, and later specify that the risen Jesus ordered the apostles not to leave Jerusalem till after his ascension. Now, what, what, what don't you find in the Bible? 
Well, that's what I was going to ask you. What you were well, you're I, saying? I've never come across a passage that said, "And now I reworked the material in the <laughs> following fashion." Okay, let me give you the the preposition, the assumption behind that. Yes, I'm assuming with most scholars that Mark came first. Okay, so if Mark came first, and if Luke had a copy of Mark, and if we know that Luke borrowed or used Mark as a as a source. So you take, and you have to do this side by side, you take what Mark says about that event, and you take what Luke says about that event. And if Mark says, go to Galilee and you will see me, and Luke says, you will see me as I told you when I was well, in Galilee. Now do the gospel accounts contradict each other in reporting where Jesus appeared to his disciples? Mr. Nalen says in his article, that Luke places all of Jesus' resurrection appearances in Jerusalem, whereas Matthew places them all in Galilee. Then Mr. Nalen concludes the writers don't agree and are contradicting each other in reporting these different geographical locations. Well, examine the evidence for yourself and see what you think. First, Luke records in his second book, the book of Acts, that Jesus, after his suffering, showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, if Luke flat out states that Jesus appeared many times over a period of 40 days, why do the critics charge that the gospel writers can't possibly be telling the truth when they report Jesus appeared in different places at different times? Let's look at what the four gospel writers reported. Matthew records both a Jerusalem appearance and a Galilean appearance. In Matthew 28, 9, he states, Suddenly, Jesus met them, speaking about the women in Jerusalem. In Matthew 28, 16, we read, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, where Jesus had told them to go, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. Now, John knew of at least three appearances Jesus made to his disciples because he says so. In John 21, 14, we read, This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. John records both Jerusalem and Galilean appearances. In John 20, 14, we read that Mary, while at the tomb, turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Later that evening, according to John 20, 19, Jesus appeared again in Jerusalem, but this time to the disciples. We read, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Then, a week later, John reports another appearance of Jesus to the disciples, again in Jerusalem. But this time, Thomas was present with the others. In John 21, 1, we find John describing a fourth appearance of Jesus, but this time Jesus appears to the disciples in Galilee. Seven disciples met and talked with Jesus there, and John describes who they are. In brief, John knows about and reports both Jerusalem and Galilean appearances of Jesus in his account. Now Luke, in his gospel, records appearances of Jesus that take place both inside and outside of Jerusalem. First, he writes of Jesus' appearance to the two men on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, 13. Then we read in Luke 24, 36 of Jesus' appearance to the disciples in Jerusalem. No critic should conclude that because Luke only cites these two appearances, he is unaware of Jesus' other appearances, or is saying Jesus only appeared in and near Jerusalem. Why? because in his second book, the book of Acts, Luke specifically states he is aware that Jesus appeared to people over a period of 40 days, giving many convincing proofs that he was alive. Now Mark includes Jesus' appearances in Jerusalem to the women. In Mark's appendix, we read of Jesus' appearances to the two men on the road to Emmaus, his appearance to the 11 disciples as they are eating, and finally, we learn of Jesus' ascension into heaven. In order to criticize Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
the critics have falsely accused them of saying Jesus only appeared in Jerusalem or only appeared in Galilee. If any of the writers had stated this, then of course we would have had a contradiction. But not one of the four sets limits on Jesus' appearances, nor demands by what they record that Jesus could not appear in some other geographical location. In Jerusalem and in Acts, Jesus is said to charge the, the apostles not to depart from Jerusalem while I am with yes. you. There's a question that you have here. You have assumed that you have the time frame exactly the same in each one of those places. And Jesus where... was around for 40 days after his, his ascension. Is that's that what, so? That's what Acts says, but Luke says that he, he went to heaven on uh, Easter. Well, hang on. Hey. Hang on, hang on. Uh, the time period eyes. is not given there. The time... But there are connecting phrases, albeit in English. Maybe you can tell me in Greek it's different. But in English, the connecting phrases are... Uh, he did such and such, and he ascended into heaven. Right. Which, of course, is perfectly they true. They have him walking down a road, and but, then they say, and he ascended to heaven. Oh, but you can't assume that those events didn't occur at the end of the 40-day period. I mean, you, you got but, to deal with these passages in order to sum those same people. Therefore, to assume that one person is saying 40 days and another is saying, you know, 24 hours, and that that wouldn't have bothered anyone uh, is, is, is utterly unrealistic. Uh, th these are complementary accounts. The critics ask, why would the disciples go fishing when Jesus told them to stay in Jerusalem? Luke records Jesus' statement to the disciples. But stay in the city, that is Jerusalem, until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Jesus' command to the disciples to stay in Jerusalem obviously occurred on the 40th day after his resurrection when he ascended into heaven. But the disciples went fishing sometime in the immediate days after the resurrection. Jesus' command to stay in Jerusalem had to do with the promise of the Holy Spirit, which occurred to the apostles on Pentecost a few days after he ascended into heaven. There is no conflict in reporting the disciples went fishing earlier. And my contention in the article is that this is the most critical, the most important claimed event in world history. You know. Yes. Forget World War I, right on. World War II. Right on. And if this is the event, the pivotal event of world history, why can we not pick up and, and see that on a certain day, at a certain place, that Jesus appeared to certain people? The, now, we have listen, a there, whole there, there is no, mishmash. There of, is no correlation between the importance of an event and the amount of historical description of the event. That is to say, uh, the, uh, the, the event that you referred to earlier, Constantine's um, uh, success in, um, in turning the Roman Empire into an officially Christian activity. You, you, you can't judge, first of all, the importance of the event and then say, I'm not going to believe the event unless I have a kind of uh, transcript of every single uh, aspect of the event presented uniformly by all the people who had contact with but it. But you all, believe... All you need is probability. Okay. All you need is good, reasonable historical probability, and that's determined by the way in which you establish any other events. If I'm not incorrect, you believe that God does inter intervene in history. Right on. And that in this case, he intervened in history. Yes. And that he chose witnesses. Right. Okay. Well, why couldn't the witnesses that he chose give us witness that made sense? That was not contradictory? They, they aren't contradictory, but you ask, why didn't God choose witnesses that would give us stuff that makes sense? Right. Now, this is really important, and right. you'll pardon me if I'm awfully direct with you. What you have done is to establish a criterion, a personal criterion, as to what God Almighty should have done in order to bring you to belief in these events. And because God Almighty doesn't do what you expect him to do, therefore you say, I don't have to take these events seriously. What you ought to be doing is this. You ought to be asking yourself, what kind of historical evidence do I require? 
when I handle the general events of human history, how much data and what kind of data do I need to determine that uh, Lincoln was shot in Ford's theater and didn't slip on a banana peel in Peoria? <laughs> and when you analyze those data, you do not find that all the witnesses give everything. Uh, you find one witness giving one thing, one giving another, but the, the confluence of data point and lead you to a certain conclusion. It isn't 100% certain, it's a probability conclusion, but it's on that kind of reasoning that you base all of your ordinary activities of life. Welcome to our program. In this part of our debate, we're going to examine the questions, can we trust Matthew's account about the Roman guards? Do the New Testament writers conflict in describing who went to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning? Did the women see angels or men at the tomb? And how many angels did they see? And were the angels inside or outside the tomb? These and other questions will be discussed tonight, and I hope that you'll listen very carefully to this important information. And I'd, I'd say this to the people here and watching this program. When this program's over, you know, go home, turn off the TV, and what you do is you take the Bible, whatever version you want, and you put it side by side. And that's all I ask. You take the last chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, put them side by side, compare them, see what they say, and I believe if you have eyes to see, you will see that there are some incredible contradictions there which lead you to, to ask, did anyone really know what happened? Listen, I love it. That's exactly what people ought to do, and when they see that these various narrators are not presenting the identical stories, ask one question. Are they complementary or are they contradictory? They will turn out to be as complementary as four witnesses on the stand to any traffic accident. And they point to the fact that you don't have collusion here. If these people all said exactly the same thing, my gosh, when I have somebody on the stand, on the other side, and this guy says exactly the same thing as the previous witness, wonderful, I want to raise the contingency fee. I'm going to win because this was done by collusion. <laughs> right. But there's a difference between between slight disagreement and apples and oranges. Well, these are not apples and oranges. You yourself have, 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 uh, have agreed that it's perfectly possible, for example, to have the Roman guard there at one time and the women there at another. It, there is no, no, I, don't, I don't agree to that. There is no metaphysical... Well, is there a metaphysical no, necessity no, no. that Romans don't. be there all the time? I don't accept Matthew's description, so I see no evidence for the guard. Well, that's a problem, isn't it? Because Matthew, according to... Papias and Polycarp was there while you weren't. I, I think also, I, I'd like to come to this thing is that you don't accept it and you keep saying it's contradictory, but I haven't seen and I haven't heard one thing that's been contradictory. I've heard many things where there's been added information that is complementary and, okay. it, and it's not in a, in a neat uh, pile, but I have not seen any one of these things that you have mentioned yet okay, or any who, other... went, who went to the tomb at dawn uh, many me? people went to the tomb at dawn uh, the women went hmm? which women now mr. Nalen wants to know who went to the tomb at dawn Matthew says Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went Mark says Mary Magdalene Mary the mother of James and Salome went Luke simply says the women went to the tomb the Apostle John writes Mary Magdalene went to the tomb notice None of the gospel writers say it was only two women, or only three women, or only one woman. Each writer describes those he wants to recognize. If one of the four writers had said only so-and-so went to the tomb, and another writer said only somebody else specifically went to the tomb, then we would have a contradiction. Now, can these accounts be harmonized just the way they stand in reporting who went to the tomb? The answer is yes. Let me suggest just one option. Let's suppose that all the women had planned to meet at the tomb at dawn. On Easter Sunday morning, they all left their homes at approximately the same time. However, Mary arrived first, observed the empty tomb, and left before her companions arrived. She goes to tell Peter and John that the tomb is empty. Now, if this happened, then John would be correct in reporting the fact that Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and left. Also, Matthew, Mark, and Luke would be correct 
in including in their reports two or three or more of the individuals in the group of women who also left to meet at the tomb. John didn't say only Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and no other women. Matthew didn't say just two women went. And Mark didn't say only three women went. They write from their own perspective. Luke simply mentions the women in general came to the tomb. And later, he lists a number of women who were telling the apostles what had happened at the tomb area. And when he does this, he includes Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others who were with them. This would mean that possibly five women had visited the tomb. Now, the others mentioned may have accompanied the group of women or come at a different time by themselves. Regardless, this sequence of events shows that the accounts do not contradict each other. Rather, they agree and blend together beautifully. On one hand, you say what great eyewitnesses these, these authors are, okay? Are. And so you get your eyewitness, and one says, this person and this person went, period. The yes. other says, this person, this person, and this person mm -hmm. went, period. Yes. The other one says, well, it's just Mary. It, no, no. It's like, no, the, no, the, the one doesn't say John. it's just, uh, it's just. Now, that's the important thing. Okay, if, okay. If, if one of them said, this person and only that person was present at a, at a given time, and the second one said uh, that uh, uh, someone else and only that person was present at that same time, then you'd have a logical contradiction. But you, see, you, you don't have that. But they don't say that. Be okay, it's like saying asking me to prove that a brontosaurus did not go with the women. No, 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 it's not okay. like that at all. Yes, it is, because <clears throat> the authors do not say that a brontosaurus was not there, so therefore, yeah. maybe there was a brontosaurus. We're not talking about <laughs> um, beasts or people who are not mentioned by any of the writers. We're talking about the ones that were mentioned. What I think that you are establishing is a criteria for, for historical writings, and that rule, the first rule would be, that anybody that writes about an event, if you have five different witnesses, they better all say the same thing, no matter what. Otherwise, identical, it's not accurate. Identical no. things. Okay, if they but, didn't say but identical things. when the women thing, got there. Well, well, okay, hold on. If you say no, okay. if you say no, okay, then on what basis would you allow Mark to differ with Luke when Mark says, I want to concentrate on this? And he names somebody that Luke says, but Luke wants to also include two others. And so he does truthfully, and he does okay. truthfully. May, may I talk? Surely. <laughs> okay. So the women get to the tomb, however, however many there were, who knows. The women get to the tomb, and they see a man, men, an angel, or an angel. Okay, whatever. Now, were those angels or men inside the tomb or outside? Because at an instant in history, they were either here or there. Now, did those visiting the tomb see angels or men? Well, it's not contradictory for the four gospel writers to refer to the angels as either men or as angels. Both are correct. Why? Well, throughout the Bible, it is not uncommon to find angels first described as men and then as angels or vice versa. Genesis 19 is just one example of what can be found many other places concerning angels. Genesis 19, 1 reads, Now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening as Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. A few verses down in verse 5 we read, The men of Sodom called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men that came to you tonight? Referring to the angels. Obviously the angels looked like men. Another example is Judges 13, verses 9 and 10, where we read, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she was sitting in the field. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man, referring to the angel, who came the other day has appeared to me. Now again, first the person is identified as an angel. Secondly, he's identified as a man. A careful study of all the passages throughout the Bible, both Old and New Testament, will reveal that whenever angels appear to men, they're almost always described as looking just like men. Throughout the Bible, angels may specifically reveal that they are angels in some unique way, as they did in Matthew 28, 2 and 3, 
for they may keep their angelic nature entirely hidden. For example, Hebrews 13, 2 states, Some have entertained angels without knowing it. Of the four gospel writers, Matthew specifically states it was an angel of the Lord that came down from heaven. Mark says they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, but something about him alarmed the women. Luke identifies the persons present as being angels. He says, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Luke also records the women were frightened by them. John specifically says Mary saw two angels in white. So in brief, the four gospel writers' descriptions of angels is not unique to them. They agree with how angels are described throughout the rest of Scripture. But then Mr. Nayland thinks the writers have erred in reporting how many angels the women saw. Well, first we must remember the four gospel writers are describing that period of time from before dawn on Easter Sunday morning until late that night. If we summarize, their description starts with Jesus' resurrection. Then an earthquake occurred as an angel descended and rolled away the stone. The guards are frightened by the angel and flee. After a period of time, Mary Magdalene, who is on her way to meet her other women companions at the tomb, arrives before the others do. She sees that the stone is rolled away and the tomb is empty. She immediately goes to tell Peter and John. After she leaves, the other Mary and Salome approach the tomb and see the angel described in Matthew 28, 5, and then they leave. Then, Joanna and the other women arrive at the tomb, and they see the two angels mentioned in Luke 24, 1. In the meantime, Mary Magdalene reaches Peter and John, tells them about the stone being rolled away. They immediately leave her and run to the empty tomb. Mary slowly follows behind and again arrives at the tomb, but after Peter and John have already departed. Standing all alone, weeping, she looks into the tomb and sees the two angels recorded in John 20, verse 12. Now this harmonization of the gospel accounts suggests a plausible sequence of events detailing who came to the tomb and when. There are no contradictions. Finally, were the angels inside or outside of the tomb? And how many were there? If we assume that beings called angels do exist, it is reasonable to assume that even angels will sometimes move during the day, that they may come and go as they please and appear and disappear as they please. I believe all the accounts agree that the angels were inside the tomb. Second, all the accounts agree that the angels were sitting. Third, all the accounts agree in what the angels said to the women to tell the disciples. Now first, do all the accounts agree that the angels were inside the tomb? Well, as we've already seen, the appearance of the two angels to Mary is a different account entirely than the events described by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mary's encounter takes place after Peter and John have left the tomb to go and tell the others what has happened. Both Mark and Luke agree that the angels were inside the tomb. Mark states, In entering the tomb, they, that's the women, saw a young man sitting at the right. Luke states, The women found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling apparel. So both Mark and Luke agree that the angels were inside the tomb. But how about Matthew? At first glance, Matthew's account seems to place the angel sitting on the stone outside of the tomb. In fact, all the events seem to happen one after another in Matthew's account, with no time passing in between them. But in other parts of his gospel, Matthew compresses events in his record the same way leaving out periods of time between the events that he's recording and joining the events all together without pausing. For example, if you compare Matthew chapter 21 verses 8 through 23 with Mark chapter 11 verses 8 through 33, you will find Matthew joins the events of three days to make it sound like it happened in just two. In chapter 28, Matthew again has compressed his account of events leaving out periods of time and the things that took place during that time and then joins them all together. 
Now, the way we know this is because the other gospel writers describe other events that happened in those time gaps. Remember, ancient writers did not have parentheses or other modern techniques of writing to clearly depict the difference in time in which the events they are describing happened. They just joined them together. But I believe that Matthew 28, verse 1, speaks of the women. It should be separated in time from Matthew 28, verse 2 through verse 4, where Matthew describes first the earthquake, then the angel descending, the stone being rolled away, the angel scaring the guards away. After these events, I believe there is another time gap, and sometime later, after the angel has scared the guards away, the events mentioned in verses 5 through 8 take place. By the time these events take place, I believe the angel has gone from outside the tomb to inside the tomb. Why? Well, because the angel says to the women, Come, see the place where he was lying. These words fit with the angel being inside the tomb. Now, it's the critic who wrongly assumes that Matthew has stated the angel always remained outside the tomb and that there cannot be any passage of time between the events described in verses 2 through 4 and those beginning with verse 5. Clearly, the angel was outside the tomb at one point, namely when he scared the guards away, but Matthew never states that the angel stayed outside the tomb and could not change locations. And there would be good reason for the angel to change location. The first being, so he wouldn't frighten the women away. And second, so he could speak to them and tell them why the body was not present where it had been placed. How many angels were at the tomb? The only way we will know what happened in the periods of time Matthew does not record is to read the accounts of the other gospel writers. And obviously, it is clear from the other gospel accounts that the one angel, after scaring the soldiers outside the tomb, went into the tomb so as not to scare the women. Another angel appeared in the tomb with him. But then how about the position the angels are seen to be in? The difference between Mark and Luke concerning whether the angels were sitting or standing can be cleared up by examining the Greek word that is used. Luke says, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling apparel. The word that is translated stood, epistosan, can also be translated appeared. For example, in Luke 2.9, this same word is used where it says, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. So it would be correct to read of the women in the tomb that two men suddenly appeared near them in dazzling apparel. Luke is probably stressing the suddenness of the angels appearing to the women, while Mark is emphasizing that when the angels did appear, they were seated, a position that would be calculated to put the women at ease. There is no contradiction in the accounts about the angels' position. Finally, all the accounts harmonize in reporting what the angels said to the women. If we combine the messages given in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is easy to reconstruct the original message given by one of the two angels. The angel said, Don't you be afraid. I know whom you are seeking, Jesus the Nazarene, the crucified one. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where they laid him. Remember how he talked to you when he was in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? Go quickly, tell his disciples and Peter that he is raised from the dead and is going before you into Galilee. You will see him there as he said. Matthew, Mark, and Luke each report part of the angel's message. Here is what Matthew remembered and reported. Mark reports almost the exact same words, while Luke chooses to report this part of the angel's message. In doing so, the writers do not contradict each other. They complement each other. In brief, there is no contradiction between the gospel writers in answering the questions, did the women see angels or men? How many angels did they see? 
Were the angels inside or outside the tomb? And what did the angels say? There is no way on the face of the earth that you can place this kind of demand on historical narratives. If you attempted to subject other historical narratives to this kind of criterion, you, you simply would have none of them relating anything. But we're, uh, not, we're not talking about uh, Caesar crossing the Rubicon. We're talking about the most significant claimed event in world history. Certainly we are. And it this, doesn't happen every and day. This highly significant event of world history is described by eyewitnesses and by close associates of eyewitnesses, and the overlap, the agreement, is about 95%, and where there isn't agreement, there is complementation. Thus, there certainly were guards there. There were certainly angels or messengers there. The guards were there at certain times, gone at certain times. The angels were there at certain times and not at others. The, the various people who came and witnessed this appeared at various times. You can, you can put these together. Let's take one of the other events. You say that there is a duplicity of authors, of, uh, and it's proven by the fact that in uh, the account about Mary, in talking to uh, the gardener, and it has to do with the fact of her uh, uh, turning, uh, where apparently when uh, the gardener is speaking to uh, Mary, who is really the Lord, she uh, speaks to him, and the Bible says she turns and she speaks to him, and then uh, the conversation goes on, and then Jesus says uh, Mary and mentions her name, and again she turns. Now you say that because the scripture, uh, and the writer there, uh, uses the word that she turned, and he says it two times, that therefore you know that we have two different authors or we have a conflict. Dis disjoints, I believe, is the well, hope I said. Term. hope I did not say that I know, ah, but all I can may, say... May I, may I quote uh, Nayland? Uh, Fine. Notice that ancient editing has resulted, not might have, could have, possibly did. Notice that ancient editing has resulted in several disjoints in the present text, such as... Mary turning twice around to face Jesus during the course of a single uninterrupted conversation. Now, the only conclusion for this, Mr. Nayland, is that, that nobody has a right to turn around in conversation with one other person. You are assuming that people have got to act in a certain way or they, uh, they, they never uh, operated historically at all. And, and really, uh, human beings are diverse and complicated, and human motivation is uh, very, very difficult to understand. And historians, when they come across events, don't go in with a kind of wooden metaphysical structure as to what people have got to do. What they try to do is to discover from the eyewitnesses what did happen. I mean, there's nothing in this universe that did not permit Mary, for reasons we don't know, to, to turn around and then turn back. Uh, and and, and if, if you go into the narratives that way, of course you're not going to get anywhere with them. But these narratives deserve more than you're willing to give them. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, Mr. Nayland, thank you for being thank with us for tonight. We appreciate your thoughts and also uh, the fact that you would share from your heart so many of these things. And also, Dr. Montgomery, we appreciate you being here and responding on behalf of the documents and Orthodox Christianity. And for you that are watching, now you have to take this evidence and you have to do something with it. You have to think about it. And you have to evaluate that evidence. Did a man really live by the name of Jesus Christ? Was he really seen by hundreds of people? Did eyewitnesses really see him after he died on a cross? And is he the Son of God as he claimed? Does that have an impact on you? I hope that you'll think about it seriously and join us next week. Good night.